can do all those things, dealing with sort of the emergency crisis, and still fall behind in the 21st century, in this global economy, unless we recommit ourselves to solving some of the long-term problems that have been with us for years. We've got to recognize, just like earlier generations, that our future is what we make of it, and unless we give everything we've got to securing America's success in the 21st century, our children aren't going to have the same opportunities. Now, I've traveled a lot over the last year, all over the world. And I've got to tell you, countries like China, they're competing to win. And there's nothing wrong with that. We want China to succeed. They've got a lot of poverty, much more poverty than we have here. And it's good for their stability if they're doing well. But I don't know about you, I, I don't intend to cede the 21st century to anybody else. America's not a nation that follows. America leads. That's what I intend for us to do once again. leads. So what, is, what, what does it mean to lead? It means countries that out-educate us today are going to out-compete us tomorrow. And that means America has to lead in education. And that's why that's why we're working with educators to transform our schools and make college more affordable and prepare our kids for science and engineering and technical degrees because those are going to be the jobs of the future. And because the future belongs to countries that create the jobs of tomorrow, we've got to lead in energy. That's why we're investing in companies right here in Nevada and across this nation to produce solar power and wind power and the smart energy efficient electric grids and investments that are giving rise to a clean energy economy. It's vital that we do that. Our nation can't lead, we can't prosper, if we've got a broken down health care system that works better for the insurance companies than it does for ordinary Americans. And we can't squander the opportunity to reform our health care system to make it work for everybody. That's why this coming week I'm going to be meeting and Harry's going to be meeting with members of both parties and both chambers. We're going to move forward the Democratic proposal. We hope the Republicans have one too. And we'll sit down and let's hammer it out. Go, we'll go section by section. Because America can't solve our economic problems unless we, we tackle some of these structural problems. And America can't lead, we can't, we can't succeed unless we're also getting a handle on our debt. We've got to confront this fiscal crisis that has been brewing for years. That's why we're cutting what we don't need to pay for what we do. That's why I signed a law that says Americans should pay as we go and live within our means. That's why That's why yesterday I announced a bipartisan fiscal commission that will help us meet our fiscal challenges once and for all. Fiscal responsibility, clean energy, a world-class education, a health care system that works, an economy that lifts up all our citizens. That's how America can lead. That's how the future will be won, with all of us coming together to win it, Democrats and Republicans and alike, and independents. With all the petty partisanship and game playing in Washington, I know sometimes you guys can feel pretty frustrated. I know it can be easy to despair about whether we as a nation can come together anymore. But for those who wonder if America can unite, just come to Henderson. You think about it. This is a town that was founded during World War II to supply metal for planes, for guns, for the arsenal of democracy that freed the world from tyranny. This is a town, it wasn't built by liberals or conservatives. It was built by Americans, by patriots who rallied around a common purpose in an hour of need. 
And I'm certain that if we can reclaim in this country the spirit of unity that built Henderson, Nevada, all those years ago, then we can build cities of destiny across this country. And the future will belong to the United States of America. Thank you. God bless you. God bless the United States of America. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, everybody sit down. This is this is the uh, this is uh, This is where I'm on the hot seat, so I gotta take off my jacket. Answer some questions. Everybody sit down. All right. Uh, some of you have been to town halls before, so this is pretty straightforward. We got people in the audience with mics, and uh, you just raise and uh, you just raise your hand. We're gonna go girl boy, girl boy. Make sure it's fair. And I'm gonna try to take as many questions as I can in the time remaining. Uh, and when you, uh, before you answer your question, if you can uh, introduce yourself so that we know who you are and, and try to make your, your question relatively brief so that we can get in as many as possible. All right? All right, as I said, we're going to go uh, girl boy, girl boy. <laughs> Young lady right there. Yeah. Thank you, President Obama. Uh, in Nevada, we What's have the second. Oh, my name is Florence Jameson. Okay, how uh, are you, Florence? I'm terrific. Great. Uh, in Nevada, we have the second highest number of medically uninsured, about 325,000 uninsured. More than five working adults, our colleagues, who are dying each week because of no access to health care. I am the founder of Volunteers in Medicine Southern Nevada, a free clinic which has been set up to help our sick and dying. There are hundreds of caring Nevadas that have rallied like a corps of angels to come and provide free health care for their struggling neighbors. Housekeepers, operators, receptionists, eligibility workers, social workers, nurses, doctors. In your health reform bill, you have a provision to protect the federally funded subsidized community clinics. It is not clear if they're going to cover the free clinics where volunteers throughout the community have rallied to give support to their struggling neighbors in their great time of need. Can you help us with that? Well, uh, thank you first of all for the great work that you guys are doing. So we appreciate that. Um, but if, if, you're, if you're like a lot of free clinics across the country, I know you're getting overwhelmed because the need is so great. Uh, the bill that Harry and I have been working on would provide assistance to a whole range of community-based efforts, preventive care, wellness care, which is absolutely vital not only for the people who are receiving services at, at clinics like yours, but also for reducing the cost of health care overall. Because the more that people have access to preventive care, the less likely they are to go to the emergency room when things are already out of hand. Now, l let me just speak more broadly about health care, because we're going to have a meeting with the Republicans, as I said, next week. Um, I've got to admit that uh, you know, this has been an issue that I was warned I shouldn't take on. No, no, I, I mean, seriously. At the, when I first came in, and Harry was part of some of these conversations, there were a lot of political advisors who said, look, health care is just too hard, it's just too complicated. Everybody says, in theory, that they want to reform the health care system, but because it's complicated, once you start putting a bill together, you get all kinds of criticism. The insurance lobby will spend millions of dollars on advertising and TV scaring the heck out of everybody. Your poll numbers will go down. 
and you're not going to get a lot of cooperation from the other side. I mean, that, that was the warning. Plus, because the economy is bad, a lot of people are already feeling kind of anxious, and so they're thinking, gosh, you know, we had to do, you know, all that stuff to fix the financial system. We had to do this stuff to fix the autos. We had this big recovery package. The deficits are going up partly because uh, tax revenue is not coming in and we're having to spend more on unemployment insurance and things like that. This is probably not the time to be too ambitious.